America's founders feared the rise of political factions that would pit Americans against Americans. Today's guest warns that the founders' worst nightmares have already come to be and threaten the health of our republic. He's Dr. Lee Drutman, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to a Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me as he does every week in the co-host chair is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, storytellers, novelists, scholars, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping the United States today. This week we're joined by Lee Drutman, a political scientist and senior fellow at New America, He's the author of a new book, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. Lee, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, so thrilled to be having this conversation. So let's let's jump right to the book, The Two-Party Doom Loop. First of all, what is the two-party doom loop? Uh, well, it's the thing that we are experiencing right now in American politics, in which uh, we have this uh, incredibly nasty, ugly politics in which everything seems to be uh, in part of this escalating war of, of partisanship with no resolution in sight and our political institutions is collateral damage. You know, sometimes it seems like we have as a nation sort of very short term memory. Uh, and there are some people who might uh, sort of hear that characterization and think that you're just talking about the Trump era. But you're not. This is their 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 longer legs to the story of 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 the breakdown of bipartisanship. Well, it's not only the the breakdown of bipartisanship, but it's also the loss of loss of trust in our political institutions. It's increasing uh, sense that the other party is a threat. Uh, and Trump, you know, certainly he's an accelerator of these trends. Uh, but he's not the originator of it. And the reason that he has uh, had so much success in this particular political moment is precisely because he is a, a response in many ways to this type of, uh, of you know, a scorched earth politics and just incredible nastiness uh, that has been building for a while and shows no signs of abating, frankly. So we're going to get into uh, the particulars of the book, including your recommendations. Just give our audience an overview of the book, uh, sort of the Cliff's Notes, and then we're going to put those aside and get into more detail. But give us an overview. Well, you know, the, the book itself kind of represents, uh, you know, part of it is a way of thinking about democracy uh, and, you know, sort of tracing a historical journey that begins really with the framers and really, you know, picks up speed. It's a sort of a, a 60 year history of how we went from a politics, you know, that was in many ways quite consensus oriented to a politics that is quite divisive, you know, which kind of builds on a couple of, of trends that have been happening, the, the nationalization of politics, the sorting of politics, uh, and the, the kind of urban, urban rural divide uh, and the closely contested elections. And you know, then the the you know final part of it is really a, a looking forward book. I mean, I think there's a lot of books that have been written in the last few years about how America is going downhill. And you know, at the end, the authors kind of shrug their shoulders and say, "Well, I I don't know. You know, something needs to change." Uh, but you know, th this was a book that was you know uh, really written to offer a way forward, and the way forward is multi-party democracy, which is the norm among advanced democracies. And uh, you know, I think is is the way forward because we are really stuck in this artificial binary that is turning us against ourselves and really you know destroying the the core of our nation. So you, you rightly mentioned that this goes back to the founders who uh, we might add were often 
bitterly in dispute of each other. They had two separate parties. It, it was city versus rural and so forth and so on. What makes you think that we could change? I mean, that was over 200 years ago. It seems to be in our DNA. And I'm not saying it can't be changed. Uh, and you give recommendations on how, but it, it, is this going to be a difficult task? It, is it in our DNA? I'm, um, you know, I think there is a myth that America is naturally a two party country. Uh, and, you know, uh, part of my argument in the book is that actually for most of the country, although we operated as a broadly national two party system, you know, the, the parties were these broad overlapping coalitions with really many parties inside of them. And, you know, that, that for a good part of the 20th century, we operated something more like a four party system with liberal Democrats. Uh, and conservative Democrats alongside liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans and those coalitions combined in different ways. Now, the framers, uh, you know, it's true very quickly, the U.S. settled into a two party system, uh, but the framers themselves, you know, were really concerned about political parties. And in particular, they were concerned about a two party system. And, if you know, if you read Madison's political writings, he's really arguing for a multi party democracy, although he doesn't have the language of that at the time, because he's saying, you know, look, inherent in, in all you know, democracies is the idea that there are factions and the way you preserve political stability is to prevent any permanent majority faction from gaining power, because once that happens, then the minority says, well, this system is illegitimate and the majority tries to abuse their power. So Madison was really uh, arguing that multi-party democracy with its fluid and overlapping coalitions was essential for our system of government to work. But at the time, you know, the, there was a sense that you could do without parties. Um, it was just sort of a, a I mean, they were inventing something new, modern democracy. So actually, uh, I would argue that multi-party democracy actually is in our DNA. And you know, American democracy is a continually evolving system, right? In 1787, the only people who could vote were white propertied men over the age of 21. Well, that's changed quite a bit. The House had just 65 members. There were just 13 states. It was, you know, a very small agrarian country. That's changed considerably. There were no direct elections to the Senate. There were no primaries. That's changed. The, ele the way electoral colleges operated has changed. I mean, so much about American democracy has changed over our almost 250 year history. And in order for any system of government to continue to operate, it has to evolve as the environment changes, as the values of society change, and as the, the country changes. And most democracies around the world are now proportional democracies, multi-party democracies, and they have made those changes over the years. And there's no reason why the U.S. can't join them. Lee, I want to ask you a two-part question that... Um... It's, it might not be fair, and it might be more than we've got time to actually talk all about right, today. Well, let's, but, let's tackle it. But but yeah, I'm curious. First of all, your your assessment of the health uh, and rigor of American democracy today. But that the follow up of it is is that a consequence of a two party democracy, or is or or is it the result of? Does that make sense? I'm not sure that I asked that right. Um, yeah, let me let me tackle both of those together. And, you know, I mean, I think when assessing American democracy in this particular moment, it's important to understand uh, that, you know, Ameri as I said before, that, you know, American democracy is continuing to develop. And you know, what the two party system looks like now is not what it looked like 60 years ago. It's not what it looked like 120 years ago. But what it has evolved to now is a very highly nationalized political conflict uh, that is sorted very much along urban rural lines and uh, with this very close balance of power. And you know, that is that is the current state of it. And it will probably be the state of it for you know a few decades moving forward, given where where trends are. Uh, so you know to there and and the other key point to, to note about this moment is that America is also transitioning to becoming a multi ethnic democracy in a way that we never have been before. So the you know the two party democracy may have worked in a particular moment in American history 
in which the parties at the national level were these broad and, and sometimes confusing overlapping coalitions among parochial local parties. It may have worked when America was a, a, a dominantly white Christian nation with mostly con conservative traditional social values. Uh, but right now it is creating this unsustainable division between urban and rural, which is exaggerated and uh, sort of uh, just hyper is the really only uh, appropriate word for it at the national level. And within the two party system, there's really no way out except for one side to win this dominant uh, position, which seems unlikely and also potentially catastrophic to, to America, given what the logical response to the losing side would be, uh, which would be violence or secession probably. Uh, and we, we, we run that movie once in America and it cost uh, 750,000 lives. So advancing or progressing or moving to a multi-party democracy, can this happen organically, especially given where we are now? Or is there something else that has to happen? Political will, change of some kind that's, that's legislated, mandated, grassroots or whatever. I mean, it's, you know, you talked about maybe years from now, we can get to where many European nations are with multi-party democracies. How does this happen? I mean, we, we seem to be locked into the two-party situation big time now in, in, in the, at the end of 2020. Well, we are and we aren't. Uh, Two-thirds of Americans say we ought to have more than two parties. Um, well, you know, pushing towards half of Americans now identify as independents. A lot of Americans just don't vote at all. Uh, and you know, members of Congress uh, describe the job as miserable, even though they continue to, to serve. And everybody in and around politics understands that we have a problem, which is the first step to a solution. Now, the solution could be done very simply. Uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that says we have to run our system of plurality single winner elections, which is the underlying electoral rules that make it very hard for third parties to thrive because in a single winner system, anything that's not a vote for the top two parties is a wasted vote, which renders third parties as spoilers and the uh, home of cranks and weirdos. Uh, and you know, th that is tradition, but it's nowhere in the Constitution, and it's a tradition that is clearly not working well. Congress could pass a law and, the, you know, could do the first thing it does in, in, the, in the next Congress, say, you know, this system has caused, you know, pointless division. It's destroying our country. It's creating this artificial binary, uh, and we're going to enact a system of proportional representation. The, the system that I would recommend is a system that's been used in Ireland for over uh, 100 years, uh, ranked choice voting with multi-member districts for the House, uh, ranked choice voting for the Senate as well and the presidency. Uh, you know, there, there is legislation in Congress, the Fair Representation Act, which is a bunch of co-sponsors uh, that in, in the House that would accomplish a good, a good part of this. But th there's nothing that prevents Congress or, you know, any state that wants to make this transition. You know, Rhode Island could do it. Uh, well, let, let me ask you a question. Is, is about to pass ranked choice voting. Uh, well, so I, I wanted to ask you about that because I think that the, the, the places where there ha where Maine famously has ranked choice voting, Massachusetts has a ballot initiative uh, in 2020 on it. What is ranked choice voting for those who maybe haven't heard of that before? So ranked choice voting is a, a simple way to vote, which rather than having to pick one candidate and more and you know having to decide whether you want to you know waste your vote and, and cast a protest vote or pick one of the two candidates that's going to win, uh, ranked choice voting allows you to rank candidates in order of preference. And if you're in, in the single winner form of ranked choice voting, uh, candidates have to get to a majority so that, uh, you know, if nobody wins a majority of first preference votes, then the candidates are eliminated bottom up. And if your candidate is eliminated, your votes transfer to your second or your backup choice. So you get to vote the candidate that you want the most and you get to ensure that your vote ultimately counts. Uh, you know, it's been it, it's been implemented in Maine. It's been implemented in a bunch of cities across the country. It's been used in Australia. 
for over 100 years in Ireland for almost 100 years. And, and most everybody who uses it likes it better because it allows them to better express their vote. It also changes politics uh, because it, it encourages candidates to build broader coalitions to try to compete for second and third choice votes. A base only strategy doesn't work. You can't just demonize the other party and you know win on being the lesser of two evils because you have to compete for for broader votes. Now there's a proportional form of it where you have multi-member districts. So take one district and you know and it, it sends like three to five representatives to the legislature uh, and then votes are allocated proportionally. Uh, in you know which which just means that the share of uh, votes that a uh, party wins in that district should translate directly to the share of votes in the legislature instead of all these confusing reversals that we have here in in the U.S. with our single member district system. It seems to me that with the exception of Maine and Massachusetts, Ireland, and the other countries that you've mentioned here in the U.S there would need to be some sort of education effort to inform citizens of, of this as a possibility? Because my guess would be that most aren't aware, except for the places that we've mentioned. Well, spread the gospel. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what we're doing here. <laughs> I mean, it's true. We, you know, I, I think a lot of Americans uh, have no sense that there are different ways to vote that might yield a, a different kind of democracy. And you know, part of, part, you know, part of our challenge, I think, if we want to have a, a more functional, productive, responsive, representative uh, democracy, is to realize that it's not just about getting different politicians; it's about getting a political system that uh, is broadly responsive and doesn't drive us apart. I, I think it's sometimes challenging because we, we want to just blame the other party or we want to just blame the politicians, but we have to understand that you know everybody is operating under a set of rules and a, and a set of electoral incentives. And if you want politicians to behave differently, it's not just replacing politicians because we keep replacing politicians and we keep being disappointed with the results, it's about changing the system in which they operate. And that's what most countries figured out a long time ago. Uh, and we can catch up as we understand that we have a problem and we recognize the nature of that problem, which is a divisive binary two party system that follows from our very strange set of, of electoral rules. You know, so the week before we taped this, and we taped this in uh, late October, um, uh, GOP Senator Josh Hawley of uh, Missouri, I believe, uh, said uh, in, in reference to the coronavirus stimulus debate uh, about the bill, he said, if it includes blue state bailout money, then I'd say that's probably a hard no. That's probably a red line for this caucus, including for me. What does it say about our politics right now that a senator, sitting senator from a uh, from a sitting Republican senator, would dismiss all of the needs of uh, for stimulus relief in states uh, that are not red? Uh, it seems like this is this is a pretty dire moment in terms of the health of our democracy. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it says that if you're a Republican, you don't think Democratic states deserve anything. And even though people who live there are fellow Americans, somehow you think that they are less than. And you know, this reflects a uh, you know, broad array of, of public opinion data suggesting that you know, people not only dislike people of the other party, but they somehow think that they're less human. And that becomes really dangerous because once you start dehumanizing people, then that gives you moral license to treat them as less than. That's what we did to slaves in this country. We dehumanized them and treated them as less than. Uh, that is what happens in countries in which genocide is committed. Uh, you know, other races are dehumanized. And to, to treat people of the other party as less than and not deserving as much is a very dangerous thing. And that, that is, you know, that is a function of this political binary in which uh, so much political rhetoric, so much political messaging uh, treats the other side as dangerous and less than. And if you start following political commentary, you will see this dehumanizing language that the other side is acting like animals. 
So to label, to, you know, red and blue states uh, seems to create, does create the image of a monolith. You know, a red state like Georgia, for the most part, has Atlanta. It has a lot of people who are democratic and progressive. California is 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 a blue state, but there are a lot of very conservative people and people who voted for Trump and, and conservative candidates there. That demonizes or or creates a false image. You know, we every state is different from every other one, and within every state, there are lots of differences. You know, even here in New England, even in progressive Massachusetts or or Rhode Island. Talk about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, this the simple red versus blue creates this very binary distinction, uh, you know, which is is like uh, you know th this real problem in our brains that we have this very uh, a kind of natural instinct to do this us versus them, good versus evil, uh, and you know that has the, been the cause of many wars uh, when we oversimplify the them. Uh, and you're right, there is much more diversity in America than red versus blue. I mean, among Democrats, even among Republicans, like a lot of them don't fit your stereotypical idea of what a Republican or a Democrat should be. Uh, you know, not all uh, Democrats are, you know, AOC and not all Republicans are, you know, Louis Gohmert. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the danger is that when you have this binary, it becomes very easy to demonize the other side because it's a it it's an us versus them. Uh, you know, but if you had a more proportional multi party system, you know, you might see that there are different kinds of people who are left of center, different kinds of people who are right of center. Uh, they might agree on some issues, not on other issues. I mean, this is what you see in multi party democracies. You know, you don't see that same urban versus rural divide. There are parties of the right that are in cities, parties of the left that are, you know, at, you know, way outside of cities. People come and go from different parties. It's not this lifelong identity uh, uh, in which it becomes like a part of who you are, and you can't admit that you're wrong. Uh, you know, it, it, it the way in which the this this heavily sorted identity-based two-party system interacts with our psychology uh, is just this incredibly dangerous thing that I, I don't think people realize how much it is acting on, on our, our understanding of the world and really closing us off, simplifying the world in ways that really make us, frankly, dumb. Hey, Lee, so uh, we've got about uh, three and a half minutes left here. Let's talk about what we need to be doing. Uh, you've talked about ranked choice voting, but let's put let's put this all in a bow. Uh, how do we solve? How do we avoid? How do we break the two party doom loop? Well, we, we got to expand uh, ranked choice voting, or preferably the proportional version of it with multi member districts. Uh, you know, this can happen either you know, state by state level with states passing initiatives or changing their own rules, you know, or it can happen at a national level in which we say to our members of Congress, you know what, you know, you don't like this system. We don't like this system. This system is destroying America. Let's try something new. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, as as we discussed for a lot of folks. Like the idea that there's some different way of doing elections and you can you can have a system that's more representative, responsive, in which more elections are competitive, in which half of the states are not cast as as you know one party or the other party. Uh, like that is a possibility. So, you know, I mean, for for people living in Rhode Island, you know, that, you know, in which it's a, a blue state and there are no real competitive statewide elections. Like, you know, that, that's a lot of states in which with a two party system, there's no competition. And, and that you know, fundamentally undermines the, the responsive nature of democracy in which there should be competition and there should be new ideas uh, that come from different more than two parties. So does the question of who wins the election in November determine whether or not this is more likely to happen or not to happen? Seems to me uh, that it is, but talk it, about that. That it is more likely which in depending on yeah depending on which candidate is is elected or in, in the case of Donald Trump reelected. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the the problem goes deeper than any single election, and you know, and I think there's a a, a deep sense of frustration with the way the political system is working, uh, regardless of who wins, and you know, even you know, 
perhaps you think it'd be easier to do this if if Biden wins? Uh, or I, I actually, I'm curious what what you think. Who, who, which, which, which outcome would lead to to making this more more likely? Well, let me. Act, I'm going to do a very Irish thing here and answer a question with a question. Um, but we've got about a minute left, and I think it maybe uh, speaks to this issue, but. You know, you, you lay out a very compelling case, both of the history and sort of the sets of solutions. What happens if nobody listens? What happens if this set of reforms and this agenda for the country uh, just is ignored? Uh, well, you know, I, I think we will slide into what political scientists call competitive authoritarianism, in which we have elections, but they're not really free and fair, in which the party in power is constantly changing the rules to try to entrench its own power, and in which, you know, violence is common, we're turned against each other. I think there, there will be more talk of secession. Uh, our economy will go downhill as capital flees the country uh, under these uncertainties. So I think it's a, it's a tremendously dire threat. And I think we have to get smart pretty fast on ways to escape this doom loop. That is uh, a very sobering place for us to have to leave it. Uh, but Lee Drutman, uh, the book is a compelling read, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. That is all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can always find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. Mm -hmm.